Welcome to the Triangle Microworks IEC 60870-5 communication protocol training videos. This video will give a brief overview of the 60870-5 protocol, which sometimes I'll refer to simply as 60870, and will also contrast the protocol somewhat with the distributed networking protocol or DNP3, which I'll sometimes abbreviate as DNP. This is the fifth and final video in the series. In the first four videos, we provided an overview of IEC 60870-5, talked about the various layers of the protocol, and went over key functionality like polling and controls. In this video, we'll discuss secure authentication in IEC 60870-5 and wrap it up with a conclusion. Now let's take a quick look at secure authentication. This is the latest section that's been added to the standard. It's basically defining a way to authenticate requests. This is very similar to the DNP3 secure authentication standard. So what this functionality provides is the ability to make sure that the message was sent by the master that you thought was sending it. It makes sure it hasn't been tampered with, and it addresses a few other things. It's basically trying to prevent spoofing where you could pretend to be the real master. So secure authentication makes sure you can't modify a message and change it, like changing a read into a control, or changing a point that's gonna be acted on in a control message. It also makes sure that you can't just replay a message, so you can't record what a control message looks like and then send that same control, you know, say a week or a few days or something later. There's also a concept of repudiation that's not really addressed. It's kind of a controversial topic whether or not there even is repudiation in this standard. Basically, repudiation is being able to prove who requested a command. So the secure authentication partially addresses that, but not fully enough to meet some of the cybersecurity standards. And then there are some things which are not addressed. The biggest one is eavesdropping because secure authentication does not include encryption. However, the spec does call out TLS if you're using TCP as a method to improve encryption. It's just not covered in the spec, not required by the spec, and technically not part of the secure authentication specification. So really what's being included in secure authentication is the capability to do authentication at the application level and to address the threats we mentioned like spoofing, modification, and replay. The secure authentication mechanism is based on the concept of a cryptographic hash. A hash is a function like a cyclic redundancy check or CRC or a checksum that when performed on the message produces a much smaller string of numbers. This smaller hash value is very sensitive to changes in the message, but it's virtually impossible to determine the original message if all you have is the hash value. So in this example, let's assume that Alice is trying to send a message to Bob in a way that Bob can be sure the message is authentic. To make it work, Alice and Bob must have previously shared a key, that is a string of numbers like a password, that only the two of them know. So Alice performs the hash function on the message she wants to send concatenated with the key. This produces a small hash value. Alice then sends the original message and the hash value to Bob. She does not send the key because that could be seen by an attacker. However, the message is not encrypted in this case. The attacker could see what the message is doing, but as we'll see, cannot modify it or send the false message of the attacker's own. In step three, Bob receives the message. Since he already has a copy of the key, he can now duplicate Alice's calculation. He hashes the message and the key together to produce a hash value. If Bob's hashed value matches the value that Alice transmitted with the message, then he knows two things. First, the message has not been tampered with. If an attacker had tampered with the message, Bob's calculation would have been on a different message than Alice used, and therefore the hash value would have been different. The hash function is carefully designed so that without knowing the key, an attacker could not modify the message in such a way that it would produce a correct hash. Secondly, Bob knows that the message came from Alice, or at least someone who knew the pre-shared key that Alice knows. Although the key was not transmitted on the link, it was intrinsic to the calculation, and without it, an attacker could not produce a matching hash value. Because of the way the hash works, it's nearly impossible to determine the key from the hash value. When a hash is used with a key in this manner, it's known as a hashed message authentication code, or HMAC, sometimes called an HMAC. Security can be challenging in SCADA networks because the messages can be used in a variety of different networks, including radio systems, serial links, and IP-based wide area networks. Also, it's possible that from one end of the network to the other, it may travel over more than one of these links. So for this reason, the secure authentication is included in the topmost of the layers, the application layer. There are three types of security that are commonly deployed in communication networks today. 
first is site-to-site -site security, which includes the use of a virtual private network or VPN and protocols such as IPsec to secure the link between the two locations, for example, between a corporate office and a home office or a master station and a substation. It does not secure the networks at those two locations and physical security measures like locks and guards are necessary to protect them. Second is device-to-device -device security, which includes the use of protocols such as the transport layer security or TLS to secure the complete TCP connection between two devices, similar to when you access your bank through the internet. However, TLS only works on IP networks and is therefore lost if a message is forwarded over radios or serial links. It also does not address the possibility that rogue software applications may be installed on a device, making use of the fact that the device itself is considered secure. And finally, there's application-to-application -application security, which ensures that individual users, not just devices, are authenticated by the remote devices and that the authentication information will be carried wherever the message travels. It permits remote outstations to perform role-based authentication and authorization so that the level of security changes depends on who's attempting to perform an operation. As we wrap up, we look at how to get more information on these protocols. As we mentioned earlier, there's no official users group for the IEC 60870-5. However, there is an IEC 60870-5 mail list, which is monitored by vendors, system integrators, utilities, and software developers. To sign up for this list, you can follow the link shown below. There's also an IEC TC57 Working Group 3 mail list, and the link for that mail list is shown as well. We hope you found this training useful. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us at support at trianglemicroworks.com.